Hello, and welcome to today's session entitled American Chinatowns, Transformative Approaches to Cultural Preservation. Uh, my name is Dee Gao. I am Senior Director of Research and Development at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And today I am honored to be in conversation with two incredible presenters, Ted Gong of the 1882 Foundation and Jen Lo from Open Box. Um, and I will briefly introduce them um, and allow them to do the presentations before we wrap up with a bit of discussion. Ted is the founder and executive director of the 1882 Foundation, which promotes public awareness of the history, consequences, and continuing significance of the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. Ted successfully led national grassroots efforts to have Congress apologize for the 1882 Act. And prior to, to founding the 1882 Foundation, Mr. Gong served in various roles in public service and international affairs at the State Department, Department of Homeland Security, as well as US embassies and consulates in Taiwan, Hong Kong, Guangzhou, Sydney and Manila, as well as other consular programs dealing with operations in South Asia and Middle East. He has degrees in at, from the University of California in history, the University of Hawaii, uh, of Hawaii at the East West Center in Asian American Studies and the Army War College in National Strategic Studies. Jen Lo is an integrative de designer, educator, and landscape architect with over 13 years of experience in the planning and design of public spaces across New York, California, and Washington. Jen is currently the Associate Design Director at Openbox, which is a design and research studio, where she applies her interests in the intersection of human-centered design and the built environment, and sees the intersection of the authentic community research um, and power of place as key tools to advance the work of justice and equity. Jen has been partnering with the 1882 Foundation to curate the Dear Chinatown Project, to spotlight stories and social histories of places within DC's Chinatown to identify projects that contribute to sustaining neighborhood placekeeping for long-term residents. She holds a BLA from the University of Washington and a master's of design in integrative design from the Stamps School of Art and Design at the University of Michigan. And today together we'll be exploring um, the preservation of DC's Chinatown through the lens of planning and community engagement efforts in Washington, DC. So now I'd like to turn it over to Jen to kick off the presentation. Thank you so much, Dee. Um, so as this is start, um, an overview of our agenda for this session. Um, first, I am going to give a little bit of background and context to my partnership with Ted in the 18. 82 Foundation through the Dear Chinatown DC project um, and provide some reflections on uh, authentic community conversations based on what I've learned being able to be a partner and collaborator um, with the organization's work. Um, and then I'll pass it off to Ted uh, to talk more about the context uh, of DC's Chinatown in particular. The, the vast accumulation of different visions, plans, and proposals for change that have been brought forth over the past few decades. And also his work um, and the collective's work in connecting the dots, the everyday planning and design work of community leadership, storytellers, and activists. Um, and then we'll close with a little bit of conversation together. So first, um, I'll start with our Dear Chinatown DC collaboration. And this uh, uh, started all during my graduate studies at the University of Michigan, uh, and Ted and I met each other in the summer of 2019. Um, my background in landscape architecture um, and uh, at the intersection of human-centered design and participatory design methods, I was really interested in sort of pushing what we can sort of do um, in terms of uh, engagement and better understanding uh, community experience and how that can inform um, different proposals um, for, for change. Um, so the, the research question that really sort of centered this collaboration together was like, how can we connect existing cultural assets to better inform placekeeping in DC's Chinatown? 
And this question came up, um, if you are familiar with Washington DC's Chinatown and have been downtown at all, uh, you see a lot of different indicators of um, uh, maybe of a, an indicator of Chinatown. You see some uh, Chinese calligraphy on top of um, uh, the La Colombe or the Equinox or the Farmers and Distillers restaurants. But ap after that, it's really hard to decipher why this Chinatown was here, uh, who brought it here, um, what the history was. Um, so what I had found out uh, across looking at a lot of different old reports, um, the, the co existing cultural preservation efforts um, were vastly inadequate. I talked about signage, about visual motifs and the architecture um, and the different sort of entries um, uh, and, you know, how we should treat different, you know, sort of dragon symbols across the district, but nothing about the people that live there. Um, and fundamentally, I do have a really strong belief that city planners don't really design for engagement, they hold meetings. And that sort of like leaves a lot to be desired in terms of how we can facilitate and plan for and design for conversations that enable us to really understand the, the people who, um, you know, feel deep belonging to a place, um, uh, both who live, live there, who do activism work there, um, to people who work there and so forth. And it's really important because um, these are the types of processes that each of us have to live with constantly. Each of us know the, the, the existing engagement processes, those checklists that we have to go, go through, the town meetings um, that we have, um, and all of that continues to drive and contribute to a lot of the ways that we don't want our cities to move in, in terms of neighborhood change. And in DC in particular, gentrification is a major force when it comes to displacement, meaning that um, people are fundamentally feeling alienated by the places that they live. And that's Chinatown, and that's largely um, most of the neighborhoods uh, in Washington, DC, which was also once known as the Chocolate City, a majority black city. So these, um, Conversations that we've been having are very close to both of us and our work together in our communities around Chinatown, but this is also a much larger, bigger picture story to tell about how do we, you know, foster conversations with communities in authentic ways um, to be able to feel like people can still feel welcome and belong to places in our city. So, I really felt like the audience was important to this conversation too. So this is really centered around community leadership, being able to express and expose and like, you know, celebrate the work that they do and as well as le emerging leadership. Um, it's a, a generational effort that, you know, things can't be solved within the time that we're here. So how do we build momentum and inspiration for future leaders who are going to be doing this work? And also, you know, presenting and showing city planning, we need to be also driving new methods, new ways of being able to do this work because um, the, the old methods have failed us. Um, and a lot of this sort of conversations we've been having too, I do want to draw the inspiration from this work. So it's both acknowledging and critiquing, um, you know, existing um, uh, engagement um, uh, methods in planning and design processes, but it's also gaining inspiration and motivation from, you know, existing creative activism. Um, if you look at uh, in New York, um, at the work of Chinatown Art Brigade and the WOW Project, um, it's really about celebrating culture an everyday sort of uh, social practice as a means of activism, resistance, and also uh, demonstrating, you know, um, place comes from the people that, that are there <laughs> and driving um, activity. Um, uh, and this also comes from, you know, uh, intersection of arts and urban planning, uh, Rostin Wu's work, um, and also aspects of like social innovation theories of being able to, you know, bring forth the assets and celebrate um, the, 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 the social, the public, the community histories of place to drive proposals um, and planning um, futures. 
so like given sort of all this content, it was like, okay, what are we going to do together? <laughs> like, let's try to see if we can design something. And some people thought this D Dear Design, Dear Chinatown DC project was an art project. Some people thought it as a design project and it is sort of both. And it also is this sort of like a metaphor too of what we shouldn't and should do. And what can we learn from, you know, more people centered um, engagement and outreach and conversations around placekeeping. Uh, so I was thinking about all the things I didn't want to do and being like, okay, what well, can I, you know, create a model or a prototype of together with the 1882 foundation to test something, uh, see what, see what we find out, what we hear, what we learn about place and what people think about um, place through the lens of DC's Chinatown. So, you know, given that uh, most engagement processes are about being reactive, it's about like, oh no, <laughs> like we need to get consent. We need to get some sort of like, okay for this. And I didn't want to do that. And like, let's create a proactive model where we're going forth and activating um, uh, a, a place. We're going towards a, an intervention in action that really has like no specific project actually in mind at this point. Um, and I also wanted to bring these people together um, with the 1882 Foundation. The DC has an incredible uh, community of public historians as well, and um, additional community organizations that are doing uh, programming work in the neighborhood. Um, I wanted to a process that was adaptable and flexible. Um, I wanted to be able to be something that Ted could leverage in the course of the 100 different programs and events and conversations he's having across the year, how could it plug into something that's already happening? Um, and I wanted to leverage the existing assets. And that means, you know, the people as well um, and meeting them where they are at. It's not trying to give them a map to a location on a Wednesday evening at 7 p.m to meet uh, at, at a meeting hall. <laughs> it's, you know, we, we go to the people. So with that, we started with a love letter, actually. Um, and this is sort of not the first sort of like, you know, uh, time that a love letter has been used in this capacity. Uh, there's a lot of different love letter and break up letter uh, uh, research methods to, to think about like how someone thinks about their relationship to a, a place, to an object. Um, and I really loved the idea of uh, using the, the love letter um, activity as an action to have people think about, you know, what do you love about Chinatown? Like what brings you here? What do you go to? You know, where do you walk through? Um, what's special? And so I wanted to use that as a sort of a test. And we tried it once. I tried it with some students first who had relationships in different Chinatowns across the country when I was in Michigan as a seeing like, what does this solicit? Am I going to find out anything in particularly important? Um, and then I also tried it again with the 1882 Foundation at a talk story event um, and observed. Um, we produced really beautiful lo love letters um, about different Chinatowns and also some interesting facts and stories about how DC's Chinatown was also special to people. But I think more importantly, through that activity, it was able to elicit exchange and conversation. Um, I heard additional anecdotes about people's personal experiences and stories about their relationships to their family members, to their friends. Um, and, their, and then also at the 1882 Foundation uh, uh, talk story event, it was a lovely way to like engage and facilitate intergenerational conversation as well. And then, so we then scaled this up. We took it outside and we went over to the Wallach House, which is one of the remaining affordable housing buildings in uh, DC's downtown, uh, right in the heart of DC's um, remaining Chinatown. And we set up a uh, humanities truck from American University, um, a couple of tents with permission from the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association and the Wallach. Wallach House managers uh, to facil facilitate a love letters to DC's Chinatown poster making event. So we had posters um, that kids can make. We also brought in the humanities truck oral history recording equipment to be able to capture those stories. And we also had a reel of the, the documentary that was made by 
uh, the Smithsonian Anacostia Community Museum um, around Chinatown a, a few years back. Um, so we had exhibit, we had uh, a making event um, and an opportunity to be able to tell some histories that are often not seen at all um, in, in this particular Chinatown. And so we had the event, but I think the most important part, which I want to center for this conversation, is sort of like, what did I, what did we learn together from this endeavor? Like, I, it wasn't, you know, in itself like a, a successful event. I think it was a, a successful in terms of what we learned from, you know, watching people engage with each other, the 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 sentiments we heard about Chinatown, um, and some also mechanics around engagement as well. Um, so I think one was really powerful is like partnership. And I think we know that, but often we don't leverage it to its maximum ability of, you know, being able to put in different networks of collaborators together between the humanities, between Ted's work, and also a couple of different organizations that have been doing a lot of work over the decades in DC's Chinatown, um, forging those relationships and communication avenues um, is a success in itself. And again, being able to have that intergenerational convening and conversation, um, I found that sometimes the uh, the adults and the elders were very resistant to actually doing a, a poster making event, but they loved talking to younger folks. Um, they'll tell them all of their stories, all of their histories. And so that was a really nice catalyst to be a, a place of sharing and learning together and storytelling together. And accessibility is a big aspect too, from like the scale of the intervention is one aspect. I think what we found was the public event was a lovely spectacle to be seen, but I do see that it was less um, of a, a, a hospitable environment for a sort of individual one-on-one -on -one exchange. Um, uh, trans Translation and how you're going to fa facilitate translation and interpretation in any given space are like vitally important, not only just from like, you know, straight up mechanics of communication, but there is relationship building, rapport building that happens. And so um, I had a couple of friends that were really able to facilitate that for me because I don't have Chinese language skills myself. Um, and that can't replace, you know, we, um, uh, don't think about enough about how we, you know, how communication um, is a connecting tool. Um, and also the type of activities. Um, again, I mentioned the like, elders had wanted nothing to do with an activity that looked like a children friendly activity, um, but they were willing to stay and like talk to us. So like one, if the activity doesn't work out in itself, like what to, can it afford and what can it facilitate for bringing people together um, and those five to 10 minute conversations with elders from the Wallach House, who we don't typically interface or wouldn't have another avenue to communicate with, is not something we should also like undersell to. Um, it's small moments as opposed to large moments, maybe some activities, um, engagement sort of things that you think are more fun, uh, maybe fun and sparkly, but it may not be the fundamental core of what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and data quality, fundamentally, what are we trying to find out? Um, and I think this is also very much in response to a lot of post-it note conversations, a lot of um, questions that are really about, you know, what's the color of that bench? You know, which style of building do you like? And that doesn't tell us a why. It doesn't tell us, you know, why from now through 20 years from now, why this place is meaningful to people, what brings people together. So I think having open-ended questions and really also quality questions coming into conversations and how you might facilitate those open-ended conversations is something we want to be driving more of um, because we live and work and exist in really complex spaces. And none of our sort of experiences about place can be really sort of like, you know, distilled and abstracted down to like one single, you know, design intervention. Um, and to wrap up sort of like my sort of calls to action and findings around engagement before I hand it off to, to Ted to kind of talk about the big picture and, and why this is important, um, minimizing barriers to communication. Language um, becomes a, a major, you know, um, both accessibility and barrier consideration. The scale venue engagement methods, 
Um, when you're looking at participatory processes too, all of this needs to be th thought of as longer time scales. Um, Ten and I and the 1882 Foundation, um, I connected with them for a very long duration of time. And it really just started with me just showing up. <laughs> I showed up to the talk stories. I kind of lingered around and like had lunch and just kind of stuck around for a little while. And we also, there's such a value in being able to observe, understand and be around folks and have conversations and be in company with people. Um, and being able to build upon and amplify existing efforts. There's no blank slates that exist. So how do we seek out new synergies, make connections and help facilitate those connections? Because it really is about interdisciplinary co collaboration because these things are hard. There's a lot to do. And I think there's a lot of different capabilities can, that can contribute to it. So with that, I will hand it off to Ted um, for some more context around, you know, what this, these kinds of conversations feed into relative to um, uh, DC's Chinatown work. So it's always, it's always good to be with Jen and it's going to be great to have a conversation with Dee as we go forward. And I want to thank all of you for uh, tuning in to listen to this program that we have. Now, you know, um, I've been engaged with uh, issues related to the preservation of Chinatowns for over a decade now. Uh, many of you have been doing this much longer, and whether about Chinatowns or other ethnic enclaves, the um, gentrification is reflexively cited as the big fear, you know, and that is articulated by raised the number of raised or removed buildings or the number of residents that no longer live in the area. But, you know, I have to say that how uh, that the preservation of buildings has never been my primary concern. I'm more concerned about preserving the stories of people telling the stories uh, of their own stories. S storytelling and oral histories have always been primary to me. But for now, I want to focus our session. I want to uh, talk about, about several approaches to the preservation preservation of Chinatowns, and that is this DC Chinatown. I went to go through several different plans and guidelines that have come and gone. And in this session, I want to leave uh, the thought with you that, and with the property developers and the city planners, that they ought to examine these past studies, regardless of where their property lines are and borrow elements of their preservation plans. Not necessary, it's not necessary to build new plans uh, in isolation. And I also think that they should consider social factors holistically, both immediately around their property lines in a district, uh, which we're going to call Coastal Zone. And we will talk about that further toward the end of the preservation. So next slide, uh, we have um, two, there are two foundational studies and guidelines to DC's Chinatown's preservation. One is called the DC Chinatown Cultural Pres uh, Development and Small Area Development Plan. And the second one is called the Chinatown Design Guideline Studies. Uh, everywhere you see, whatever document you see in late, they always cite these things or are built upon these guidelines established probably around the 1980s. What these two studies and things around them have done is they have defined the boundaries of an area, the streets in which Chinatown is, is, is uh, composed of. And it gives guidelines on how to make a building look Chinese uh, to reinforce Chinatown. And this term comes constantly in every, all the planning studies and discussion, is to make Chinatown a distinct cultural destination. And it's pinned with the archway at some within eight streets. Uh, slide, you can decide for yourself how, how successful that has been. And the next slide, please, Jin, Jin. And, but there are four other studies that we want to look at in patient. Um, one is the, uh, the uh, SLA Chinatown Green Street project that was done in 2014. The Urban Land Institute realizing a new vision of Chinatown Park 2017, 1882. We go back up to the other places. <laughs> but the uh, 1882 Foundation is a um, uh, 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 Chinatown Off Street project, which we did in 2020. And we have a current project with 1882 Mellon on something we call the 506 508 project. 
So the first study we want to look at is this 2014 Chinatown Green Street project. And it was done by the, uh, the American Society of Landscape Architects. And uh, as I said, it was done in 2014. So at that time, Monument probably had completed some um, some of his programs, uh, development. They're working on each one. We're not going to talk about it, but I think a lot of the uh, ASLA project didn't get as much publicity as it should have in 2014. Uh, anyway, next one. Next slide. What the project did is basically something like this. We're going to take a street or an area, we'll talk about it more, but it was a Green Street demonstration project to talk about drainage and how to make the street greener and the roofs and forth greener so that you have something that might look like the corner picture you have on that street. And it goes from that particular street, goes right up to Chinatown's Park. Next slide. So the second, uh, the second project we want to talk about quickly is something by the Urban Land Institute. And what they did was work with the Mayor's Office of Asian Pacific uh, um, Affairs and looked at that park in the center. That is the uh, Chinatown Park. Uh, it has a very fancy other name, but we all call it Chinatown Park. Uh, the green, uh, the blue area at the bottom shows you where the Chinatown Green Street project went. It went up to that area and then it then the China, uh, Urban Land Institute basically took over the, uh, started looking at the park and they wanted to design it to do what they were calling uh, uh, activate the park. The odd thing about that design was that you see all the little pink dots there. They said uh, this little square did not have enough things to attract activities. So they wanted to put little uh, 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 cables, Table things like that, as well as that circular thing on the right side of the corner, is a an architect. I mean, a monument of some kind. And what I never could understand that was that almost just two or three years before they completed this study, uh, the the park, which is operated by the Park Service, U.S. Park Service, had taken out all those physical things like benches and so forth because there was a problem problem with people occupying that and making it uh, uh, unattractive for people to visit. So they took those those benches out and I never know how why they didn't consider or thought about it. I remember once in one of their uh, one of their uh, uh, listening sessions, the listening sessions with Gene talked and I said, uh, uh, why do you want to put anything in there? And the person says, uh, well, you have to do something with the park. And I said, isn't it just good enough to have a green space, an open green space? And they said, no, you have to have of some sort. So that drew, drove some of what they said. Let's talk about it a little further. But what I want to note is that little brown street or I street is, take next slide. They made the great recommendation that they should close that street from traffic. So that on the left side where the park is and where the buildings are, where the people are walking in the middle of the street will be a, uh, what is the term they use? Warnif Street It's sort of like slight, it's a closed street. The pavers from one side, one side of the street side and make a unified sort of plaza there. It might, if it gets built, it might be something like this where the activity stretch from the street to the building side. Let's go to the next slide. The third, the third uh, project that we want to look at, or proposal, is something that 1882 Foundation were doing, and also with Jen, we were collecting oral histories. Oral histories, and uh, this is what we call the Chinatown Off H Street Project. ARP helped us fund to collect oral histories of these three buildings. Actually, the main one that we were most interested in was the pink building in the middle, which is actually a very active Guangyong temple. And so we were in at that. That temple is very active, very, uh, very good. Have you ever been to Taiwan and Taipei? It is exactly the way you would see an urban temple uh, there. So that's in Chinatown. And then the next buildings, the red building on the, on the very old acupuncture shop. 
and a Chinese herbal medicine shop, not doing very well and in business wise. And the one on the right, the red brick one, is a corner grocery store. You look and see the next the next slide. And many of the things that we we're thinking about in terms of trying to preserve or collect oral histories of there is also things like Jen had mentioned before, Wong and Wo project at uh, New York, which businesses and uh, traditional preservation and tradition uh, preservation of traditions were maintaining the same shop. Here's a backside entrance look at some of the build that that set of buildings. Those three buildings are on that. If you look at the long picture, uh, that's the still the current image of that block and the area that we were looking at was the uh, where the brown building starts on the left of that row so next slide you was the thing that triggered a lot of what we were doing was an effort to build a hotel right behind the row of houses and the, the row of houses in the front uh, they're white, their picture is white or that slightly off uh, uh, tan color. And that whole thing was to be incorporated into a large building, uh, hotel. It didn't incorporate the three buildings we were particularly interested in. But what we did, uh, what we were interested in seeing how much the developer can help us in the preservation of the three buildings we we're most interested in. So next slide. So what that did was allow us to, uh, the owners of the shops didn't want to sell their property. And those three properties were never part of the hotel building until we approached them about helping us sort of provide some funds to preserve those buildings. And what they came back was, why don't we buy the whole building or incorporate it into our, our design? The three owners, shop owners, didn't want to do that. But what came out of it was that the building, uh, the hotel owners were still so interested. They said, tell what, we'll repair and fit the building if you give us a right away to go through the building, through the temple, into the lobby of the new proposed hotel. That also didn't work out uh, for a lot of reasons. A lot of reasons had to do with the hotel being too, uh, uh, too uh the the density was too high uh people didn't want it so it never it never got uh, beyond the city hearing stage but what it did though was illustrate to us that it is possible to like get together with property owners who didn't or think about incorporating one part of, a his, of an effort for historical preservation and then offer or make an agreement that could have worked if it had carried out so this private partnership was very uh, was an important principle for us to realize that could happen. What it did too also was it addressed some issues like uh, like some of the clutter on the on the street, the main front of the temple in front of, in front of the of the um, the herbal shop and the sh and the and the convenience store, and they would have they created an artist writ artist's um, rendition of what it might look like if it was totally reformed. That would address issues of sanitation, next slide, and other, other issues that were facing that corner. Now, the next project we're looking at is the 506 project. This is actually something uh, we, 1882 has an office in this building at 506 I Street. And what we recently had is that we have a, uh, we got a Mellon Foundation grant to help us renovate the whole place, like make it into a social workspace, make the whole building into a social workspace. To show the next slide, you have a sort of a, this is a current space, but the idea is to activate the activists. So the idea was to build a space where more than uh, other APA organizations can come together, it becomes a social workspace. The concept that we have is that you have to bring in activities. So you're not just reacting to the closure or the gentrification of places, but you want to build in a place that attracts other organizations that have a stake or an interest in having activities, holding activities in Chinatown. So that gives more reason for people to come into the place. Next, next slide. 
So that's the 506 and 508 project. And what would have happened if we had done it? So our building is where in the, uh, you can see the church on the left side and the yellow house on the right side. In between is, uh, is another part of the church in uh, Chinese Consolidated Benevolence Association and us. It would have created, we were able to, and we we're going to build on it, but we would have reinforced the idea that entire block from the Chinatown, the church, to the Yellow House were made of nonprofit organizations or organizations that weren't, that weren't uh, designed to, uh, to make money. They're not commercial proxies or restaurants, that sort of things like that. And if you combine that with the idea of the, the Chinatown Park becoming part of a unified sort of front plaza area, then you could then create this area that is primarily cultural and humanities oriented. That presents an alternative or recentering of the Chinatown from the H Street commercial area back into this commercial uh, this area. Next slide. So our five or six project is in the upper circle, and then below is the Chinatown H Street. So. The Mellon Foundation is actually committing about $500,000 over a three-year period to build out that uh, social workspace for us. And that block combined with, say, the H Street project and the corner bottom left of that block allows us to think about filling in that space of the whole block, right, with cultural and humanities or programs that are not sure in the sense of being another uh, sports bar or some other thing like that in that place. And that addresses another aspect of the another China, uh, city proposal, which was figuring out ways to make them sort of more active and usable. That will address many of the pro other problems you have, like um, homelessness in between the alleys, or there was the sales of drugs in between or behind the herbal shop and things of this sort. That would then create this whole block as something that is oriented toward Chinatown revitalization without a commercial, but still engaged with commercial interest. Next slide. The, the interesting thing about this is as we develop the plan and we go back to the idea of what was, what, what do we want to preserve or the larger preservation, we go back to the Chinatown Green Street project where we first started. The street between where that red red block is, is where the ASLA building is. And the Ill, the part that we looked at was just that one block. So you see the Chinatown Park, and then you see the street. But the proposal for ASL LA program actually extended the Green Street all the way from the Chinatown Park to the park at the city center. They also had a cross street, the blue one, which is called Civic Street which extended down from Carnegie, uh, now the Apple Center, Apple and Carnegie Library Center, and then down all the way to the National Portrait Gallery. That created this sort of like, uh, I would say X mark space, but it's more like a cross. And that in a way defined, defined the space, right? Defined a space that, uh, uh, that uh, we want to think about a Further. You know, before I just sort of digress a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to, this is the, the next last slide, but, you know, I want to talk a little bit about when I first began advocating for the preservation of Chinatowns, a Chinese American architect and urban planner from Boston had asked me, why do you want to preserve Chinatowns, right? And we all know the standard responses, but what the architect added had more impact on me. And you know, it's affected my thoughts on preservations of our stories and our space for over a decade of programming and projects we've undertaken under the 1882 Foundation. And he said, for preserving Chinatowns, he thought were boring because they're philosophical. But the more interesting questions were imagining and visualizing and constructing how streets and public forums could be connected and the spaces built to facilitate interactions among people. 
their greetings to one another and their ideas. You know, that, that establishes this community and is how to be dynamically, not to res, res, be restrained by preserving static things. So, so what we want is community-centric museums, community-centric urban uh, layouts. And with that in mind, this ASLA Green Street project plus a Civic Street uh, uh, is uh, create a or defines almost like a cultural zone. The crossing streets are like a linchpin to define a larger cultural zone within which Chinatown would be one of the several contributing elements. And other elements within that are including the MLK Library, the Shakespeare Theater, the Woolly Mammoth, as well as the building museums and the Capitol Jewish Museum, which is just below us. You know, that sort of marks the space cultural and heritage, and the city ought to celebrate it. You know, next slide. Who would it be to have a space that is de defines the culture, the nation, the nation, national capital's heart? It's not something commercially dominated by co commerce. It's not defined by privately driven interests. The commercial issues will follow. It is defined as a cultural center or humanity center. I think that would be great. I'm not sure if other places can do that. But within that zone, Chinatown's preservation will fit and thrive better as part of a whole than it is simply by itself. Now, to do that then requires public policies that we can work on, whether at the city level in D.C. at the federal level. We have to define the zone and its boundaries. We have to provide for safety, sanitation, and adequate shelter and services for the unhoused. You know, support infrastructure, the, the design of support infrastructures, roads and street nicest the zone as a cultural touchstone, not for the DC Washingtonians, but for the DMV communities, the communities surrounding DC and even for communities that might be visiting the Washington, D.C. Another aspect is we have to incentivize property development and commercial operations so that they embed local considerations and community storytelling into their building design and their daily use. We should promote humanities and public education about visual arts within the zone. Why do I say that? Because it's a tendency I see where the humanities, uh, the arts, with their, uh, you know, with uh, statues and things like that, get a lot more prominence or attention than to us guys who are the historians and st storytellers. So I like the zone to focus on that, envision sort of national park story centers or neighborhood centers. In Washington, D.C., I don't know about, but there is so much attention to building a large scale national. Uh, 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 a large uh, center where you have arts and you have stage plays and you have all this sort of stuff. But I think it would be better to spread this among all the districts and have small centers that neighborhoods can come together and tell their stories, right? And it's unique because we are a national capital that allows us to tell the stories to a na national audience. Now, the one thing is to we don't have to wait for the government or policy to do this. And so one of the things that we're doing in Washington is uh, that there is a fifth project we ought to look at. And that is something we call If Buildings Could Talk. So the idea is you find these spaces, and we've done this, I think, uh, uh, where you look at the primary areas of your uh, display windows and shops and so forth, and incorporating into them these uh, exhibits that tell in that space. So again, it goes back to the idea of community-centric museums or community-centric or uh, community-centric uh, urban designs that tell stories and hold stories, museums without out walls uh, and things of this sort, history and places. That's another conversation. But that could be done now. You could do it now. So we can try to get together with Downtown Bid and then try to get that moving forward. Those are things that we can work again, the principles public private collaborations and a dynamic storytelling process that can change, especially 
especially nowadays as we have digital and other other, other electronic processes that make the pro uh, the idea of telling stories, holding stories, telling stories much easier and more done. So uh, it's the idea of dynamic storytelling that's oriented toward community. So with that, I'm going to get give it back to Dee, and maybe we can go on. This is, by the way, our our last logo. We have talk story events, and we have public presentations. Uh, Every month we will have one presentation somewhere in Chinatown and part of that theory is that Chinatown has to have a purpose, not just for originally it might have been a place to uh, be protected from the racism that surrounded them, it might be a place where people, new immigrants can gain skills, later it becomes a place where you can get Chinese, Chinese, Chinese food. Now these things all change and it should be, and now I think, a, cultural, a place for cultural touchstone. People return to renew their sense of identity, renew their sense of community. Sharing them is the core of what Chinatown probably is, is and we should, we should make that happen. Wow, thank you both so much for sharing your work. Um, in this space. Um, a lot of what I heard from both of you really resonates. Um, and I love that taking this deep dive into DC's Chinatown really allows us to kind of explore these issues that have broad applicability to Chinatowns across the country. And I also love seeing in both of your presentations, um, the collaborative efforts between Seattle's Chinatown, New York's Chinatown, and how that has influenced projects in DC as well. Um, you know, I think a few of the key themes that really resonated with me um, the, that you both spoke of was kind of the sense of reclaiming space um, and also reimagining place in a way that um, brings it back to the community. I think a lot of Chinatowns have um, this phenomenon of um, of, of their space being taken away, um, even historically how Chinatowns were formed and how um, Chinese immigrants were only allowed to live in certain spaces and then and through eminent domain, through large scale demolition and today through gentrification displacement, there's all these pressures on, on Chinatown. And a lot of these processes that you guys are both talking about involve reclaiming that space and reimagining what it can be used for to support the, the community. And I think that's really, um, powerful. Also, you both spoke of reclaiming um, the planning process. And Jen, in particular, you were saying this this process has failed us. Um, it has not, it was not designed in a way that really benefits or includes communities like Chinatown. So what can be done to um, to fix a system that was not designed for, for these people? And I think you both provided really tactical strategies on um, you know how to how to reclaim that planning process and take agency back to support the local community. And of course underpinning all of that is this need for this slow work of building trust both you know, with the community, between organizations, through public-private partnerships, trusting property developers, trusting developers, or or you know, built and um, just fostering that that sense of community. So there's so many intersecting layered themes here, um, and we have, I believe, about ten minutes for for discussion. Um, but I I just kind of wanted to to ask you both. Um, Given all of these kind of competing priorities, I think you know there's a strong sense to support the local community. Ted, you mentioned this idea of creating a cultural zone or a heritage zone that then attracts um, uh, people to um, to enjoy the culture. How how do you balance all of the current needs, or how do you maybe through community planning processes, but but how do you find a way to balance and support all of these different consumers of Chinatown, so to speak, from the residents to the small business owners to the tourists um, um, and uh, and visitors alike. Like, is there a tension there or, um, you know, in, in terms of scarcity of resources, how do you prioritize um, the future vision? You know, uh, for, for me, and then Jen could also uh, add uh, these things, but I, I've always, uh, 
I, you know, when the, the normal development process, we have a piece of property, right? And the developer is going to develop it in the way they want within the boundaries of whatever the square footage or whatever it is. And they will, and the city will also help them go through that process, of course. And they will always have the section where they say, okay, let's take in consideration the cultural issues, the displacement issue, the heritage issue. They're all in a way good meaning in the sense that these regulations are in place where the property developers actually has to, if nothing more, has to check the box, but then try to do it. And the question then becomes, okay, uh, one, as Jen is on, how do you measure that, you know, in the standard way that a government does that? Is it cause upon the usual civil rights organization they always deal with, right? And those people all great and good, but it's not really touching directly the people. So you're getting a, a filtered process. That's one. You have to figure out a way, as Gene and I have always, how do we make sure that these uh, responses and these thoughts are reflective of the actual community people who buy, who don't normally even engage with government except when they get a traffic fine or something. But the uh, the uh, the other process, how do you, the development process can be very long and your first, your first effort is a focus group that's at the very beginning of the project and 10 years later, you don't know if that is still the same or if it's continuing to evolve. So that's why, Jen, maybe you could talk a little bit more about that, but the other part is that the developers, that's what I'm trying to say is the, the, the property developed and the government has to think of it holistically. You have to look at that whole area, which includes more than just that area where your property development is going to be. And in that process, you need to think that you also have some responsibilities for maintaining the safety and sanitation of the issues. You have to think about it. And it's not just within your own square footage, but those areas around that. And the more that we have defined the zone uh, then we realize that the priority is to maintain this cultural heritage zone and the property develops have to adjust. Thanks, Ten. Um, I also think about, like, I think uh, as people, we have a hard time being able to, like, uh, uh, sort of uh, exist in difference. And I think, uh, especially in planning process, we want like everyone to get in a single file line <laughs> and have like the same trajectory, the same sort of ideolo ideology, the same, you know, the same person. And even working, you know, with the 1882 Foundation and getting to know the different communities in Chinatown, everyone is very different. There's more difference that exists in this small footprint of a place than there is similarities. And I think in any given sort of like urban space neighborhood, that's just, we hold that true. And so like, how do we get out of the scariness of being like, oh my gosh, we're going to not see eye to eye. We're going to have difference um, and recognize and be okay okay with dealing with sort of suspending that you know tension and you know making small steps to find where that intersection is like if that is one thing for instance if it is storytelling and we can all come together that we want a place that we want to tell stories how can we like build on a small moment to be able to repair some trust in this like a very big scary sort of ecosystem of a lot of distrust and a lot of overwhelming feelings about um, a, a lot of different issues that are compounding that Ted has mentioned too, that we can't you know, solve right away with policies and like systemic issues. Um, but like, let's like find a moment <laughs> and then move together there. And I think we undervalue the being able to, you know, appreciate the small achievements too. Like, what can we, like, think about, like, you know, three months down the line, six months, one year increments, instead of thinking about this huge lofty vision that is supposed to take us from, like, now to 25 years. Like, that's a huge jump. And people get very disinterested and challenged by, like, these long-term things. So if we start to build in small, like, more human scale moments to, to achieve something and have conversations and wins, 
um, that's what I try to hold on to in order to sort of bigger, to like build bigger momentums. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not the smartest guy, <laughs> but it's almost like it's a paradigm shift. Everybody where every urban developer, every urban government is trying to do the right thing. So the emphasis is always on the property developer. You're, you're focused on the idea that if the property developer makes money and changes his, uh, his or her from a uh, place from uh, from uh, commercial development, mixed use development to small uh, small buildings and so forth. That's the primary thing. The very way that we define what the Chine, the Chine town is, it, for all its good intentions, is that statement that says we want to make sure that Chine town remains a unique cultural destination, right? A unique cultural destination. By almost defining that way, you're actually in the back of your mind, you're saying it's a destination for tourists, a destination for uh, property development or for uh, uh, government how or things of this sort. But, but if you take that out and just say our zone, <laughs> which there are so many representative offices, so many historical things, there are five active synagogues within walking distance of my office in Chinatown. That space is shared with uh, 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 China, uh, Jewish uh, immigrants as much and as long as DC has been there as it has been with Chinese, right? And the more we do our contacts today, like Gene and I are talking, we're working on, there's a Filipino connection. <laughs> there's all kinds of things there. But the idea is, uh, if you put the emphasis shift it, it we're not going to no longer going to think in terms of what property development is going to bring us the most money, right, or the most prosperity measured by financial return. Rather, that zone, that large switch in heritage and history, that the city ought to grab it and make it uh, uh, celebrate it and put that as the dominant that you want to do, then the businesses will follow, right? And if you do that, then what you're doing is saying the importance of this heritage represented by community groups, individuals, is more important than sort of building another hotel or another uh, or another uh, uh, mixed use office building, right? But you're not gonna you're not gonna displace them. Those guys are gonna follow whenever you were saying there's public private collaboratives work on it on that make sure that they work we work together but the focus is on community the intersections how do we to allow, allow them to exchange ideas that really touched on my last question for both of you I, which was how do we know when we're successful how how will we know when we have successfully um done authentic engagement um, mm. or driven towards this vision of um, unique cultural and heritage-based place keeping. Um, and so, Ted, you you shared a few ways to measure that success. Jen, um, do you have any final thoughts about how will we know when we succeed? Uh, great question. Um, Ted started to mention definitions. And I think that's a, an important aspect of any sort of start to a, uh, a project together is I hear a lot of ambitions about community centered approaches to planning or development or um, revitalization um, of neighborhoods of cultural districts. Um, and in order to like define success, you have to have the community design defined the success at the very onset. So if we're not having conversations about like, what are, what is the key objective of this like endeavor together? Like, what do we want to achieve? And like for the communities that it's mostly going to affect, what do you see sort of as the, as metrics of success? Mm -hmm. And that could be things that are very tangible quantitative things like I need my small business to thrive for the next 20 years because I want to pass it on to my kids or it's like I just want to be able to sit on a bench and like 
for half a day reading my newspaper <laughs> with somebody else enjoying yes. and doing their yes. thing across yes. the street. Yes. Yeah. So we'll start to see like definitions of what people see as success if we start to let them in at the very onset mm -hmm. and we hear a lot of things of like oh it's community centered but let, let me get my plans in place first before we have a conversation <laughs> yeah. Yeah. um yeah. so how do we flip that that that's yeah. my yeah. my takeaway ted and, and, and you know it's it, it's not discounting the bottom line the financial bottom line if if the dodging department store like in the middle of the China, DC Chinatown and probably one of the last of the old traditional uh, sundry type stores, you know, uh, gift shops and things like that uh, can turn a profit, but still be like the Wong They're both profitable and they also are preserving tradition or participating in it. That is a major of success. It is not just that you have to show that you reserved all of tradition or that you have to show that you're making like X so much profit, but that could be there like Eaton hotel or any of these things, place like that. Or for example, the Chinatown garden restaurant, which is the one of the first, first restaurants in DC Chinatown was one of the first places for the on the own associates. If it can be maintained at stories there and then at the same time, be a profitable business. That's that. Those are measurements of things. If I can have uh, the Chinatown off of H Street and the temple maintained, perhaps it can't can't keep itself by itself as a traditional thing. But if I add a bookstore there or something that tells about Chinese American history or culture or about Buddhism or that, and that becomes successful in terms of attracting businesses. Or if the acupuncture and your herbal, herbal medicine shops, they're not doing very good at a lot in terms of businesses. But if it were to be able to, the city were able to reform like they have in some of the plans called the Great Tree Project, invest in making those places stable to allow them to maybe modify their business, but keeps the character of that Chinese store or tradition and then makes it profitable. Those are measurements says, can I change the city city policies in such a way that they are cognizant and supportive of things that are culturally or humanities oriented and not necessarily based upon how much revenue they can get from that space. Those would be great measurements. <laughs> or if the, if the, if the uh, we're happy because we have Smithsonian and the connections there, but if their current project looking at things of how the uh, how to stretch out beyond the National Mall can be connected with exhibits that are in our If Buildings Could Talk project, that is a major one. We've expanded the audience of people that can be aware of, uh, of Chinese culture at the same time um, uh, made many more people walking the mall or even around. So I can reach out to you, Dee, in New York and have a portal between us and you. But why does that portal on my side have to be in a brick museum and to be at the corner of uh, of the Walt's <laughs> office, which is right in the corner right there. So that creativity will elicit its own excitement and develop other things things that are both uh, public education oriented as well as uh, financially successful. Those are things that we can look, look at. Th those are all so inspiring. Thank you both so much. We are unfortunately out of time and I feel like we've only scratched the surface here, um, but I hope everyone has enjoyed today's program and that we get to continue to talk about cultural preservation in Chinatowns um, uh, at you know future opportunities. But thank you, Jen. Thank you, Ted. We look forward thank to continuing you. the conversation. <laughs>